So today I wanted to share some of the data that my research group has come, uh, has recently presented in the Journal of Urology regarding mycoplasma and urea plasma molecular testing. So bacteria in the urinary tract, for most of us, we, we came of age, I guess, medically speaking, in an era when urine was considered sterile and bacteria in the urinary tract were always indicative of infection. But this concept has been, over the years, been key to all of our definitions of urinary tract infection, in some cases actually comprising the only diagnostic criteria. But when we begin to dig deeper into the actual evidence, there really isn't any universally accepted definition of urinary tract infection. And there's no threshold for bacterial colonization that's pathologic, no consensus on the organisms that are considered uropathogens versus normal commensals. So, more sensitive techniques of detecting bacteria have now revealed that part of that confusion may come from the fact that healthy asymptomatic individuals, those even with normal voiding patterns, can bear a diverse community of microbes within their urinary tract. And we dubbed this the urogenital or the genital urinary microbiome. The past 10 years have seen a rapid expansion of what we understand about this human microbiome. And these are those polymicrobial communities that live within us as human hosts, and each of which are adapted well to the biological niche in which they live. These communities are typically symbiotic in healthy individuals and can even perform a number of beneficial functions by regulating neuronal responsivity, preventing pathologic infections, maintaining epithelial barriers, and even supporting normal host immune function. So we now understand that urine is not in fact sterile and the microbiome performs critical functions in the maintenance of bladder homeostasis. So, when can this go wrong? Well, shifts in this resident microbiota that do not perform the normal functions of the microbiome are termed dysbioses. And these are imbalances that have been implicated in diseases of almost every organ system from the central nervous system, indeed, to the genital urinary tract. And taking a lesson from what we've learned in other organ systems, particularly in the gut, we've hypothesized that dysbiosis in the genital urinary tract, defined again as an expansion of pathologic or pathobiont organisms, can lead to a breakdown of the epithelial barrier, increases in vascularity, tissue infiltrations of leukocytes, and even if unchecked, will eventually lead to muscular, neuronal, and immune system dysfunction. In alterations in gut, vaginal, urinary microbiota have previously been implicated in a range of genital urinary pathologies, such as bladder cancer, benign prostatic hyperplasia, overactive bladder, interstitial cystitis, but the significance and the utility of these results are not yet clear. But the idea that microbial changes in the urinary tract are that are undetectable by standard clinical cultures could be responsible for symptoms is not that foreign to us. It's not uncommon that patients present to a clinic complaining of uncomfortable symptoms similar to those experienced during a urinary tract infection, but their clinical cultures will be negative and driven to a certain extent by patient and even provider frustration and insistence that these symptoms feel very much like they derive from an infectious source, there's arisen an untested hypothesis that we must just not be detecting these infections in patients due to limitations in our testing modalities. So this hypothesis has promoted the exploration of more sensitive bacterial detection techniques for clinical use. Quantitative PCR is one such method and can measure levels of bacterial DNA, although it does only detect the species that were chosen to be measured in that assay. So in previous studies of patients with and without urinary tract infections, PCR has good concordance with clinical cultures. Both will detect the same organisms when the clinical culture is positive. The problem is it will also detect bacteria in a large number of asymptomatic patients. So while molecular approaches to bacterial detection, such as quantitative PCR, can identify a wider range of bacteria in more patients, and may even promote faster assessment of antibiotic susceptibility or drug resistance, their role in testing for culture negative patients has not really been explored. So if we have these tests and they have much better sensitivity, we can now detect bacteria in the overwhelming majority of patients. How do we know whether what we find is something that needs treating? Well, that's really the big question that hasn't been treat tested just yet. So let's take a step back into the 18, 1890s when we can try to place this rapidly evolving information to a different context. So Robert Koch uh, proposed a set of criteria to establish the involvement of specific bacteria as a cause of disease, such as they must always be present 
in the disease. They must reproduce the disease when given to a healthy host. Um, they they must be isolated from the host when the presence of the disease and in, in an experimentally infected host who has, has those symptoms, they, can, they need to be, be recoverable. The specifics of those postulates aren't actually that important and they have been updated by a large number of people since then. But fundamentally, these ideas remind us that there are methods for establishing the role of bacteria as the cause of disease. Methods that are necessary to return to if we're to make progress in our understanding of urinary conditions. So, that is where our testing of urea plasma and mycoplasma came in. That's a way of illustrating this point. And we'll talk specifically about a kind of patient with irritative lower urinary tract symptoms in the presence of a negative urinary culture, clinical culture for bacteria. And so this is an example that has, is very common in the clinical scenario um, and where a transition to molecular testing in these infectious-like symptoms has already occurred. So there is a big debate surrounding specific microbial testing for urea plasma and mycoplasma in lower urinary tract symptoms. As we are now seeing evolve in the realm of UTIs, testing for mycoplasma and urea plasma has already undergone the evolution to molecular testing. Older culture-based methods, which frequently took several weeks to provide a result, have largely been replaced by more modern PCR-based detection. Yet, there's not really been any studies to demonstrate that these more sensitive techniques actually provide equivalent results. In fact, studies using molecular detection techniques like qPCR have demonstrated high colonization rates from 40 to almost 90%, even in asymptomatic subjects. So, while these species have been implicated in certain conditions, such as non-gonococcal urethritis in men or pelvic inflammatory disease in women, there's no convincing evidence as yet that these organisms play a role in chronic, irritative lower urinary tract symptoms. Several early studies demonstrated that patients with these LUTs ex who exhibited cultures positive for urea plasma or mycoplasma improved symptomatically with antibiotics but recurrences were common and the resolution of symptoms typically did not relate to bacterial clearance. Additional studies have failed to demonstrate any association of these bacteria and lower urinary tract symptoms at all. And that confusion in the evidence led the European STI Commission to recommend against testing for these organisms even in symptomatic patients. Yet despite this evidence, clinical testing for these atypical organisms in patients with negative clinical urine cultures and lower urinary tract symptoms is very, very common. So we set out in our own hospital system to look at how common this was. We looked at our single community-based hospital system and found that within one year, this was after those recommendations to avoid testing, almost 600 PCR-based tests for urea plasma and mycoplasma had been performed. Interestingly, 64% of the tests ordered were in patients over 65, an age group in which these organisms are almost never found. When we examined what the associated diagnoses were for all of these tests, the majority were done for non-specific indications such as urinary tract infection, site not specified, or other disorders of the kidney and ureter, or even benign prostatic hyperplasia. Less than 5% of the tests ordered were for indications for which some evidence of an association with these bacteria exists, such as urethritis or pelvic inflammatory disease. And to me, these data indicate a perception or maybe even a desperation on the part of clinicians to find an infectious cause for patients with these bothersome kind of nonspecific urinary symptoms. To evaluate that association, we therefore took an independent population of about 101 control patients, asymptomatic patients, both male and female, and 78 patients with uncomfortable or irritative lower urinary tract symptoms all of whom were culture negative, and we evaluated them using both next-generation sequencing as well as quantitative PCR. So here are shown the results for next-generation sequencing. And by NGS, there were no differences between the groups by either relative abundance of the bacteria or the presence of detectable mycoplasma or ureaplasma DNA from these subjects. Using quantitative PCR, the levels of mycoplasma and ureaplasma present were negatively associated with symptoms measured by domains on the genitourinary pain index. So meaning the more of these bacteria you had, the less likely you were to be significant. I mean, excuse me, the less likely you were to be symptomatic. And this was true for pain, urinary symptoms, overall quality of life, although that one didn't quite reach significance. And then all of those symptoms lumped together in the total guppy score. 
So maybe it's only specifically associated with urethral pain. That's often, I think, a common perception. So we looked specifically at both dysuria and urethral pain, as well as at urinary frequency. And none of these associated positively with ureaplasmal or mycoplasma DNA or their presence. In fact, again, that negative association persisted. The levels of bacteria DNA were consistently lower in symptomatic patients. So clearly, mycoplasma and ureaplasma do not meet Koch's criteria for causing these lower urinary tract symptoms. So how can we reconcile older studies and anecdotal reports of improvement with treatment with this data that definitively shows the absence of an association of mycoplasma and ureaplasma DNA um, with lower urinary tract symptoms? And I actually think we can if we come back to where we started, to this idea of a microbial dysbiosis, which is way more complicated than the idea of a single organism causing a unique specific infection. So mycoplasma and ureaplasma are commonly found in healthy people, but can also be increased in the setting of other genitourinary infections, such as bacterial vaginosis, or Gardnerella, or Trichomonas, or Chlamydia. In these associations may explain why some people improve with antibiotics where we may actually be treating the coexisting infections. In addition, there may also be virulence factors specific to different mycoplasma or ureaplasma strains that could also determine pathogenicity. So in this manner, the bacteria may be both colonizers, common colonizers, as well as something associated with specific infections, depending on the environment, the bacterial community is around, and the individual strain features. But in the end, all of these data point to the idea that simple bacterial detection is not actually as simple as we think it is or as we want it to be. More sensitive detection using molecular diagnostics or ultra-sensitive cultures doesn't necessarily fix that. We can't just assume that these newer techniques like qPCR provide equivalent information to the standard cultures, and nor can we understand how to really use them until we better determine the baselines. So environmental conditions, host factors, strain features, bacterial community composition may all alter bacterial pathogenicity. In some cases, we now understand that E. coli can be protective, lactobacillus can possibly be harmful, and in the end, our clinical judgment is the most important factor. So it's important to remember, testing for infection isn't that simple. The focus of clinical care should be on treating the patient, not on treating a test. And whatever testing is obtained must be heavily informed by clinician judgment, with antimicrobials reserved for situations in which antibiotics are likely to make a difference in their outcome. So future tests may take a different approach to informing these decisions, and the development of prognostic markers for infection or the identification of bacterial virulence factors may be the way that we now can denote your pathogenic bacteria. And hopefully with that information, we'll be able to develop newer therapeutic approaches aimed at restoring that normal microbiome and supporting bladder function. Thanks.